The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This is the homily for Easter. Resurrection and its truths. And this is the theme. In the ancient world, especially the ancient Christians, they did not use the word Easter or Feliz Pascua. They didn't wish each other on this day of Easter like that. But instead of that, they would say, Christ is risen. And the other person will respond, yes, he's truly risen. Cristo resucitó. In verdad ha resucitado. I would encourage you to wish in this way, say Christ is risen and teach the other person, yes, he's truly risen to respond. The theme that I've chosen is resurrection and its truths. There are five themes I'm going to talk about under, underneath the resurrection and its truths. Resurrection and the prophecies. Resurrection and the feast of the first fruits. Resurrection and the women. Resurrection and Peter. And resurrection and John. So first, resurrection and prophecies. Jesus not only predicted his resurrection, but he also emphasized that he is resurrected from the dead would be the prophetic sign to authenticate his claim that he is the Messiah. There are so many prophecies about his resurrection, not just about his birth or about his suffering, about his resurrection alone. There are so many prophecies and I have classified it to four sections, Gospel of Ma Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. So totally there are 18 times he predicted his resurrection, that Jesus will rise again. 18 times he predicted. One of the famous passages, Jonah and Jesus, this needs explanation. So please pay attention to it. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39, Jesus said, He said to them in reply, An evil and unfaithful generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So we always compare this with the, the three uh, days Jesus was uh, dead and then he rose on Sunday. So Friday, Saturday and Sunday morning he rose again. Uh, first of all, let us try to understand this concept of Jonah. Jonah is from Galilee. Uh, we have proofs from Joshua chapter 19 verse 13 and 2 Kings chapter 14 verse 25. They talk about especially the place and 2 Kings talk, uh, talk about Jonah himself. Everyone knows about Jonah. He was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights. Other than Jesus, he was the only prophet of God who came from the Galilee. Jonah, son of Amittai, was 8th century BC prophet from gath Heper in the Galilee, a town located on the west side of the Sea of Galilee in the territory of Zebulon. St. Jerome identified Jonah's village and the location of his tomb two miles from Sephoris on the road to Tiberias. So we can read it in his commentary on Jonah. So Jonah chapter 2 verse 1 to 3 in the prophet book, prophetic book of Jonah, we read this verse. This is very interesting. But the Lord sent a great fish to swallow Jonah and he remained in the belly of the first three days and three nights. Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the belly of the fish. Out of my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the womb of Sheol, I cried for help and you heard my voice. This is the interesting factor here. From the womb of Sheol, who lives in Sheol is those people who are a righteous people but who are dead, they're sent to Sheol. Sheol is, is the bosom of Abraham. So if Jonah was in the womb of Sheol, that means... In the womb of, in the belly of the fish, he's dead. Jonah was dead in the fish. When the fish spat out, he came back to life. When Jesus talks about a sign of Jonah, he's talking about the death and resurrection. Jonah was resuscitated just like Jesus not just resuscitated, but he was resurrected. He was the first one to be resurrected. It is connected with the first fruits, we'll explain later. That is why in John 2, verse 18 to 22, the Jews intervened and said, What sign can you show us that you should act like this? Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Raise it up. He's talking about resurrection. The Jews replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple. Are you going to raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple that was his body. And when Jesus rose from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. 
and they believed the scripture and what he had said. So, my dear brothers and sisters, you want to know Christ, read and understand the scriptures. Scriptures show how Jesus is the one who came to save us all and rise us all. Resurrection and the Feast of the First Fruits. John chapter 20 verse 2 we read, It was very early on the first day of the week and still dark. First day of the week. During the Passover festival, the Passover Sabbath is a very important Sabbath. It's a high Sabbath. After the first day after the Sabbath is called the first day, the Feast of the First Fruits. What is this Feast of the First Fruits? Why was this day significant to Jews? Why will it become significant to Christians? Genesis chapter 1 verse 4 to 5 we read, Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. God then separated the light from the darkness. Then we read, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. Evening came, morning followed the first day. So, in other words, the first day when God created light from darkness and the last day is the Sabbath day. So, what was the first day? Sunday. Sunday was the first day. So, but people gave the last day for God in Sabbath day. But now, in a new covenant, we are not going to honor God on the last day, but we are going to honor God on the first day. Why? Because the feast of the first fruits, the intention was to give the best for God. The first is the best and give the best for God. Leviticus chapter 23 verse 9 to 14, Moses has talked about the celebration of the feast of the first fruits. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and tell them when you come into the land which I am giving you, reap its harvest. You shall bring the first sheaf of your harvest to the priest. who shall elevate the sheaf before the Lord that it may be acceptable on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall do this. On this day, when, you, when your sheaf is elevated, you shall offer to the Lord for a burnt offering. Offering an unblemished early earling lamb. Its grain offering shall be two tenths of an epa of brown flour mixed with oil as a sweet smelling oblation to the Lord, and its libation shall be a fourth of hin of wine. They gave bread and wine along with the lamb. You shall not eat any bread or roasted grain or fresh kernels until this day. When you bring the offering for your God, this shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations, wherever you dwell. So, this feast should be celebrated forever. But I don't think anybody celebrates nowadays the feast of uh, the first, first fruits, except the Catholics. My dear brothers and sisters, Jesus rose, not on any other day, but on the first day of the week, on the feast of the first fruits, where the Jews were called, the Israelites were called to give the best for God in the entire human race. Who is the best person? Jesus. And we gave Jesus on the first day of the week. And Jesus rose on that first day. The best one came from us. Acts of the Apostles chapter 20 verse 7 we read, We sailed from Philippi after the feast of unleavened bread, and rejoined them five days later in Troas, where we spent a week. Eutychus restored to life on the first day of the week when we gathered to break bread. Once again, people started this celebration of the first fruits right from the beginning by breaking the bread. That is the Eucharist. Paul spoke to them because he was going to leave on the next day and he kept on speaking until midnight. So, my dear brothers and sisters, people started to celebrate the first day of the week as the feast of the first fruits, not just only after the great Sabbath, but every first day of the week because Jesus rose on that day and Jesus is the first fruits and Jesus is the best of all humanity because we have to give the best on that day on the feast of the first fruits. 
That is why in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 we read, I was caught up in, in the spirit on the Lord's day. What is the Lord's day? The resurrection day is Sunday. That is why people always ask, you know, we supposed to worship God on the Sabbath day, that is Saturday. Why we worship on Sunday? Because Sunday is the first day of the week, not the last day. Here on, we give the first day because Jesus rose not on any other day on the Feast of the First Fruits. It is Sunday, which was also the first day of creation. Saturday was day seven, day four, day one had to be Sunday. Resurrection Sunday is the first day of the new creation in Christ. According to the schedule of the seven sacred feasts, this day is a feast of the first fruits, this, which Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5 to 14, was celebrated the day after the Sabbath of Passover week. This day was to become the new covenant Sabbath, the day set aside for man to commune with God. It is a Lord's day, the day of worship for new covenant believers. Believers, why we worship on Sunday? It is because of resurrection. How was this feast fulfilled in Christ? Jesus Christ is Himself the first fruits of new creation, who makes possible the first fruits of the harvest of souls into heaven that will result in the resurrection of the righteous dead at the end of time. Romans 8, verse 22 23, we read, We are we are well aware that the whole creation until this time has been groaning in labor pains. And not only that, we do have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we are groaning inside ourselves, waiting with eagerness for our bodies to be set free. So we are part of this first fruits. That is what Paul is explaining. It is through our baptism into Christ's death and resurrection that we have now become reborn into the family of God. So by the resurrection on the festival of first fruits, Jesus is recreating everyone new because he is the first one to be resurrected. And all those who participate in his body, who become part of his body, is recreated, reborn, a new creation. That is why baptism is very, very important. Jesus, after the resurrection also, Jesus breathed into them as God did with Adam. Like God created Adam, Jesus is creating the apostles and through the apostles and through the baptism later, every one of us. There must have been enough daylight to see into the interior of the tomb on, on the first day when Jesus rose. This suggests that the opening of the tomb faced east. That is why they were able to see what was inside the tomb. It is interesting that the instruction for God's tabernacle were that it always to face towards the east. When God said you make this temple, it should be facing the east so that the sunlight will enlighten the place. The temple in Jerusalem was also built facing east as were all early Christian churches including St. Peter's Basilica in Rome were built facing the east. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 15 verse 20 to 23 we read, In fact, however, Christ has been raised from the dead as the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep. As it was by one man that death came, so through one man has come the resurrection of the dead. Just as all die in Adam, so in Christ all will be brought to life, and all of them in their proper order. Christ the first fruits, and next and this, at his coming, those who belong to him. So that is why the festival of first fruits understanding is very, very important. Jesus Christ is a resurrected firstborn son of God. He is a true lamb of the sacrifice, and now in our new covenant liturgical feast, we unite ourselves to his sacrifice and in turn receive him in what has the appearance of a cake of unleavened wheat and wine, which was also offering along with the sacrifice of the lamb at the feast of the first fruits. He is a food for our souls and we are commanded to consume no other food before partaking of Christ. Maybe that is why, my dear brothers and sisters, the sunrise on the first fruits, on the day of the first fruits, enlightening the tomb to see the resurrection of the Lord, Maybe that is why we call Easter. Resurrection and the women. John seems to indicate that Mary Magdala is alone, although the other Mary of Clopas may have accompanied her uh, or followed soon after her. The other Gospels list Mary Magdala as one of several women who go to the tomb of Christ on the first day of the week. That is why resurrection and the women, not resurrection and Mary Magdalene alone. Mark chapter 16 verse 1 names these women along with Salome, the mother of James and John Zebedee at the tomb just when the sun had risen or was rising. Luke does not mention how many women went to the tomb. He writes that they went at the first sign of dawn. It may be that Mary or both Marys went first before dawn and others came at first light. 
There may have been two or three groups of women going to the tomb that morning. Mark and Luke indicate that the women had come to the tomb with aromatic resins and herbs to anoint Jesus' body. And this is the third day in the tomb. Why didn't they come the day before? Because it was Sabbath. The Gospel of Mark records that the, women, that the women were concerned about who would help them roll the stone away from the tomb entrance. But when they arrived, they discovered that the stone, which was so big, had already been rolled back. So, among all the women recorded here, someone is missing. Someone should be there. But she did not go. Who is that? Blessed Mother, the Mother of the Lord. Why she didn't go there? Because she knows he's no longer in the tomb. The son had risen as God's first fruits of the new creation. Mary Magdalene said, Rabuni, the great Rabuni, God, find my brothers. Rabuni means the great, uh, my master. But, but how Jesus responds to her is, find my brothers. Here, the plural form is used, brother plural in Greek, Adelphoi. Adelphos literally means from the womb in Greek, designating those born from the same mother. Who is our mother? Blessed mother. The mother of Jesus is our mother too. He says brothers from the womb. It is the same word used for Jesus' relations in Mark 6 verse 3, which generates a misinterpretation that Mary had other children because he used always the same brothers from the womb every time. Throughout the New Testament, when referring to Jesus' kinsmen or to the apostles and disciples, the relation to Jesus or to each other, the word Adolfo is used and not all these men or brothers from the womb. So in other words, my dear brothers and sisters, the resurrection under the women title shows the truth that Mother Mary knew very well that Jesus will rise. He will resurrect. And resurrection and Peter, the fourth thing. You will notice that from the time of the preparation of the upper room for the Passover meal in Luke's Gospels and from now on in the Gospel of John as well as in Acts of the Apostles and Galatians, Peter will always be paired with John. So she ran, Mary Magdalene, and went to Simon Peter and to other disciples whom Jesus loved. So Peter and other disciples went out, came to the tomb. They both ran and other disciples ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial clothes there, but did not go in. It's very interesting. John should have gone inside, but he didn't go. Why? Because he is respecting the primacy of Peter, the leader. He must go inside. Mary Magdalene also says to Peter first, the primacy of Peter. In other words, resurrection talks about the primacy of Peter, how Peter is so important for, for the apostles as well as for all of us. John is acknowledging Peter as Christ's choice as a leader of the apostles. From now on, when the apostles are listed, Peter is listed first as always. But now John is listed immediately after Peter. From now on. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 13. We read, when they entered the city, they went to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John, and James and Andrew. Peter and John. Peter's brother is actually Andrew. Andrew was the oldest one. Peter is the second one. But look at the order of the list. Peter and John. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial clothes there and the clothes that had covered his head. Not with the burial clothes, but rolled up in a separated place. Separate place. The other disciple also went in. So in other words, my dear brothers and sisters, we can read once again in, in the Corinthians also, Paul talks about how Peter has been given the first prominence because he's a leader. So resurrection proves the primacy of Peter. So you better be careful with Peter and the success of Peter. Resurrection and John. The other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first and he saw and believed. What did they see and believe? The burial clothes. Remember it is plural too. There were two clothes. We all know about the Shroud of Turin. You know, according to the material analysis, the image analysis and forensic analysis, this cloth is not an ordinary cloth. In 1988, uh, uh, the carbon dating did a big, big, big blunder. They did not follow the protocol. 
And now, according to an Italian scientist, it is dated just during the time of Jesus, according to the carbon dating now. So what they did in 1988 was a big, 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 big false thing. And I can talk about Shroud of Turin in another topic. But there was another cloth, Sudarium, which covered the face of Jesus. Why? Because they beat him a lot. He, his face would have, usually the crucified men, face would disfigure. So they covered with a kind of tablecloth. They call it Sudarium. So probably they did with Jesus. That is why that is also found. Only John records that. Because Sudarium and the burial clothes became the greatest relics later in the life of the Christians, early Christians. They kept it safe with them. So Sudarium is found in Oviedo, Spain. They, and according to the blood analysis, the Sudarium which was found in Spain, the Shroud of Turin which is found in Italy, they belong to the same person. How the image got into it, nobody knows. So it was a position or form of the clothes and not, a, not just a presence that convinced the beloved disciples. So they say they believed. They first saw and believed. What did they see? The image of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus. Because the, 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 the print that is found in the Shroud of Turin, it's not possible with the latest technology also. The image analysis proves that this is something beyond it, it eludes science. So, my dear brothers and sisters, resurrection and its truth. Resurrection of Jesus is not just that. It proves why Sunday is important and why Peter is important, why Blessed Mother is important, why the Shroud of Turin is important. And those people who do not believe in God, you want proof? The proof is right there, shroud of Turin. All that you need is an open mind. Dear brothers and sisters, Jesus is truly risen. And he's risen for us. Christ is risen. Yes, he's truly risen. Happy Easter, Felices Pascua.